Well, I appreciate the uh, opportunity uh, given to me by uh, Pastor Bremlin, and uh, it is my privilege uh, to be here uh, ministering the Word of God. Now, um, sometimes the pastor gives a, uh, uh, a theme right, to the guest preacher, but it looks like this morning I'm giving a, given a theme through the song, or right, it's redeemed. <laughs> so... Um, I'm reminded of a uh, story about a preacher. Uh, everywhere he goes, he preaches on evangelism, which is perfectly okay. But one day, uh, the home pastor asked him to preach on prophecy, you know, for a change. So he said, uh, okay, I'll preach on prophecy. And then uh, when he went up to the pulpit, he said, uh, Jesus Christ prophesies, you need to be saved. And then he went on evangelism <laughs> again. So I'm trying to... Um, figure out how uh, this uh, theme from the song, Being Redeemed, and the uh, title uh, for the sermon for this morning. Well, if, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Amaziah. Uh, I'm sorry, not Amaziah. Second Chronicles 25, and we'll be studying on Amaziah. Yeah, one time a preacher said, let's turn to the book of Hezekiah, and some folks were turning, trying to find Hezekiah. Second Chronicles 25 and verse 1 to verse 2. And we found that, uh, let's stand and um, read this passage. Second uh, Chronicles 25 and verse 1 and verse 2. Let's stand in honor of God's word. In Second Chronicles 25 and in verse 1 and verse 2. The scripture reads, Amaziah was twenty and five years old when he began to reign. And he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jeho. Aden of Jerusalem, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. I read verse 2 again, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. Let's pray. Our precious Lord, we give thanks even for this uh, beautiful morning, and even the uh, life they've given us, and the health they've given us, and above all, the salvation that we can have in the Lord Jesus Christ both the abundant life as well as the eternal life to come. And we look to you, Lord, that your very presence be with us here, even to speak to our hearts, and even to meet even our uh, deepest needs. And that, Lord, even to, um, as your people, Lord, we will strive even to follow you uh, with a perfect heart. We commit this, uh, our preaching into your hands. Bless it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, please have a seat. In 2 Chronicles 25 and verse 1 and verse 2, the Bible introduced uh, this king by the name of Amaziah. Um, during this period of time, Israel is divided into two um, kingdoms. The northern kingdom is known as Israel, and then the southern kingdom is known as Judah. Um, so we see here Amaziah is a king in the southern kingdom, uh, Judah. Uh, verse, 20, uh, verse 1 tells us uh, when he was 25 years old, he began to reign. And I think it's amazing for somebody at the age of 25 to become a king. Um, I thought uh, it was quite a challenge uh, for myself at the age of 25. I started pastoring a church in Singapore. But Messiah did a far greater thing, to be a king of the, uh, you know, the nation of Judah. Um, but in verse 2, uh, it tells us uh, that uh, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. The title for this morning's sermon is Amaziah, the man with the imperfect heart. Amaziah, the man with the imperfect heart. Um, all the songs that we have sung are on being redeemed, and that is great. You know, but the Jesus Christ did not come to this earth just to save our soul from hell and to redeem us, you know, to heaven. I think uh, his intention is far more than just saving us from hell, but it is his intention to mow us into his image, to mow us into perfect us, that we will have his likeness in us. And so God is in the business of perfecting us, but uh, sad to say, um, some of us and, you know, men like Amaziah, he seems to be contented uh, with an imperfect heart. I mean, he'll do what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but 
But the Bible says uh, he had an imperfect heart. And uh, he seems to be contented uh, with that. Now, it is no comfort to us if we desire to live our Christian life being imperfect. Sometimes we excuse ourselves. You know, I'm the flesh, and, uh, you know, and uh, I'm prone to sin, and um, you know, I, 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 I can't be uh, perfect. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, we can't, the Bible doesn't teach uh, sinless perfection. Uh, the reason why Jesus came into the world to die for us is because none of us can be perfect. Uh, if we can be perfect, uh, we don't need a Savior. We can't. And that's why Christ came to the world to die for our sins. But when we talk about perfection, we talk about in the sense, uh, in our heart, that there is a healthy fear of God. Uh, we have a desire to follow God. You know, whenever we are confronted with the will of God, you know, whenever the Holy Spirit burdens us to do something for Him, uh, we should strive, you know, to follow God in a very uh, personal way. Uh, sometimes folks, uh, even back in Singapore, they think that, um, well, you know, I should be a, a good church member uh, in case, you know, the pastor saw me outside sinning. You know, or the, the pastor confront me on this issue or that issue. Uh, but what we don't realize is that the one that is going to perfect us is not the pastor. <laughs> you know, I mean, God himself is capable of perfecting us. You know, God himself is capable of dealing us and bring us to the point of perfection. And not just the pastor of the church, but God alone is able. Um, and um, I don't wish to go through a series of um, you know, uh, uh, difficult experiences by people in which how God deal with them and God perfect them through those experiences. But coming back to King Amaziah, we see that uh, we are to strive for that perfection. Um, if you put your finger in 2 Chronicles, and let's go to the book of James in chapter 1 and verse 2 to verse 4. In the book of James chapter 1 and verse 2 to verse 4, we'll come back to 2 Chronicles again. In James chapter 1 and in verse 2 to verse 4, uh, the scripture reads, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And so um, James is telling um, the believers to count it all joy when they fall into diverse temptation or trials. And the purpose of God allowing trials in our lives is to perfect us because uh, the trying of our faith work at the patience. And I hope we are moving the right direction. Every time our faith is trying, we become more patient. Um, but very often the trying of our faith work at impatience, right? <laughs> Instead of patience. Um, <clears throat> but they say, let pa patience have a perfect work, that it may be perfect and entire, lacking or wanting nothing. You see, that is God's goal for all of us. Every time God allows something in our lives, His goal is to mold us into His image. His purpose is to perfect us. And uh, there is a reason why we need to be perfected. Um, it is said that um, when a baby giraffe is born, the mother will do a very uh, seemingly uh, cruel thing. You know, the mother giraffe will look at that baby giraffe and then it start kicking the baby. <laughs> you know what I mean? To get the baby to stand up and start to walk uh, maybe gingerly initially, but to get the baby giraffe to, cut, to, to stand up and walk. And after the baby giraffe uh, stood up and the walk, uh, the mother would kick it and make it fall again. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then start kind of kicking it to get it to stand up and walk. Now, to the untrained eyes, uh, it looks like a very cruel thing. But what the mother is doing is that is telling the baby giraffe, get up and walk and, and start to run because predators are everywhere. <laughs> You know, the lions, the cheetah, and all these predators are everywhere. And if you can't get up and walk and start to, you know, run, you know, sooner or later they're going to be eaten up. 
And so it looks like a cruel thing to the untrained eye, uh, but it is necessary. So sometimes God allows severe trial, fiery trial. You know, he, he wants to perfect us uh, so that um, we be uh, ready uh, for the wiles of the devil because the devil is a roaring lion, is walking around seeking whom he may devour. But coming back to Second Chronicles 25 and verse 2, um, talking about King Amaziah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. If we look at this uh, verse 2 and scrutinize it a little bit, it says here, Amaziah did the right thing. And to his credit, he did the right thing in the sight of the Lord. You know, I mean, that is, um, I mean, hats off to him. <laughs> uh, he did it before the Lord. I'm reminded of, um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with David Gibbs, and uh, he told a story about his grandfather. And his grandpa uh, kind of uh, run a cattle business, and they would go to auction and pay so much you know, for a herd of cattle. And uh, one day, uh, David was just uh, telling uh, the grandpa uh, how much um, they sold, uh, they purchased for this herd of cattle. And the grandpa said this to David, he said, that is, that is not a fair deal. You know, we underpaid the farmers. Now, I want you to take this money, you know, in the date of winter, drive maybe like a hundred miles, and to that farmer's house and return this money. And then to tell them that we are Christians, you know, and, and we are sorry that we underpaid you. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, David Gibbs has to... Um, uh, uh, he drove all the way there, gave the money to these farmers, apologized for uh, underbeating it, and the farmers literally were in tears. And uh, David gives a grandpa. He wants to do what is right, not in the sight of man, but in the sight of God. <laughs> you know, to most businessmen, man, I got a great deal. You know, but David's uh, uh, grandpa. You know, he has a conscience before God. He knew that he has to do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Now, in Messiah, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. You know, but in the latter part of verse 2, it says, but not with a perfect heart. And uh, so uh, maybe when we kind of uh, read through superficially, we say, what's the big deal? Most people are not perfect. <laughs> you know, but that has a serious consequence uh, to come. It is like an accident um, ready to, uh, to happen. And so uh, don't underestimate that phrase, not with a perfect heart. Now, verse 3 says, It came to pass when the kingdom was established to him that he slew his servants that had killed the king, his father. But he slew not their children, but did as it is written in the uh, law, in the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded, uh, the father shall not die for the children, neither shall the children die for their fathers, but every man shall die for his own sin. Um, if you were to read the, the chapter before this, uh, his father, Joash, um, sad to say he began uh, as a good king, and then he killed his benefactor, uh, Jehoadus, uh, the priest that rescued him from being killed. And then uh, later on, the servants will kill his father, uh, Joash, and uh, Amaziah, when he become, when he was established, he took those servants that killed his father, and he killed them, but he killed not the, their children. And he did that according to the uh, laws of Moses, where the father uh, will not die for the sins of the kid or the children, and the children will not die for the sins of the father. Now, uh, it takes a lot of faith to keep that commandment, uh, because if you kill him, after killing the servants, keep in mind, you know, say half a dozen of those servants, there may be 20, 30 of the kids, you know, and they bear that hatred for the king, you know, and they could assassinate the king. You know, it takes a lot of faith to say, I'll kill the, the parents, you know, but not the, the kids. Um, well, the, this is the law of Moses. Now, if you go to China years ago, those empire you know, dynasty. You know what's the philosophy in those days? When they kill somebody, they wipe out the whole family and their relatives. You know, the Chinese have a saying, when you cut the grass, you got to remove the roots. 
If not, when, the, uh, the, when spring comes, you find the grass will grow again. And they had this philosophy. You know, if I'm going to kill somebody, I'll wipe out, you know, their relatives, their family, and so nobody will take revenge. And that's the concept. It, it takes faith for Amaziah to kill the, uh, the, the, the parents, but not the kids, or the fathers, but not the kids. So uh, if you have a box, you take it, and Messiah passed that test, and uh, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. In verse 5, Moreover, and Messiah gathered Judah together, make them captains over a thousand and captains over a hundred, and according to the houses of their fathers, throughout all Judah and Benjamin, and he numbered um, them from 20 years old and above, and found them 300,000 choice men, able to go forth to war that could handle spear and shield. He hired also a hundred thousand mighty men of valor out of Israel for a hundred talents of silver. And there came a man of God saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel to, to wit with all the children of Ephraim. But if thou would go, do it, be strong for the battle, God shall make thee fall before the enemy. For God had power to help and to cast down. Well, the uh, next um, test that Amaziah had is that he numbered his army 300,000. He hired another 100,000. He had a battle to fight with the Edomites. And um, so he thought that I'm, I'm pretty secure. I have all bases covered. It's almost like a Sun Tzu out of war. You know, you got a larger army to fight a smaller army, then go to battle. If you got a smaller army, don't go into battle. And uh, so he had a huge army. And he hired the armies of the army of Israel, another hundred thousand uh, a soldier. Um, but the men of God came to him and say, "O oh, king, don't let the army of Israel go with you, because God is not going to be with you." All right. If you want to go, maybe in a very sarcastic tone, the prophets say, "You go and be strong, because God's going to make you fall." Um, why? Uh, God doesn't want the army of Judah to join the army of Israel. Reason is very simple. If you study all the kings in the northern kingdom, they did not have a single good king. Yeah, if you study the kings in the southern kingdom, they had many good kings. You know, and, uh, but the northern kingdom had no good kings. Uh, Ahab would have burned his children, you know, worship Baal. Um, if you study the... Um, the king of Israel at this point in time, uh, they would, um, uh, what he called that, uh, they would uh, worship the golden calf made by Jeroboam. And uh, they, they, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. So I think that is a biblical principle here. You know, I mean, um, uh, Amaziah wasn't hiring the Gentiles. Amaziah was hiring the Jews. You know, and the Jews, uh, you know, we're supposed to be brothers. Uh, but the Bible does teach a biblical separation. You know, I mean, if a Christian is insane and refuses to hear the Bible, refuses to follow the scripture, we are called a separate. And uh, it is not because you're a Christian, I'm a Christian, we should be together. I mean, today there are liberal Christians. There are all kinds of Christians. You know, and, and we are told to practice the biblical separation. In the New Testament, be not unequally yoked in the book of Corinthians uh, with the unbelievers. And so uh, we need to be cautious. Um, now, Amazon actually had the, um, the benefit of, the, um, of earlier the teaching uh, in which uh, he should be uh, very much aware of it. Um, if you take your Bibles and uh, just go back a few chapters to Second Chronicles in chapter 18. In Second Chronicles 18 and verse 1 to verse 3. Second Chronicles 18 and verse 1 to verse 3. Now he had the example of his great-great-grandpa. He says, Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance and joint affinity with Ahab. And after certain years, he went down to Ahab to Samaria, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance for the people that he had with him, and persuaded him to go out with him to Ramoth Gilead. 
And Ahab king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat king of Judah, Will thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered and said, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. So Ahab asked uh, the northern king, uh, king uh, asked the southern king, uh, Jehoshaphat, who is a good king, he said, let's go to battle. And uh, we'll not go through the whole history of it, um, but if you go to chapter 19 and verse 2. In chapter 19 of Second Chronicles and verse 2, And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore it is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Now in that the battle between Jehoshaphat and Ahab, and they went to, to, into battle, they lost the battle. Ahab was killed. You know, Jehoshaphat escaped, uh, just barely escaped with his life. Um, and the prophets say, should you love the ungodly? Um, so we see here there is a principle of a biblical separation. Now, um, in verse 9, as we come to verse 9, Amaziah said to the men of God, But what shall we do for the hundred uh, talents which I have given to the army of Israel? And the men of God answered, The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. Well, a hundred talents is a lot of money. <laughs> Maybe in today's term, it probably run into millions. Um, and um, so when we study in Matthew 25, uh, talking about the, the, the uh, master gave a talent, you know, two, two talents and five talents, and then what would they do about it? Uh, a talent is a huge amount of money, and a hundred talents, it heaps of money. So um, Amazon say, man, you know, they already deducted from my credit card, all right, a <laughs> hundred talents of silver. <laughs> what am I going to do? And the, I'm just kidding, right? It's credit card is not in the Bible, but um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have that in the Bible, but not credit card. <laughs> but, um, but like uh, any one of us, man, I mean, maybe several millions were gone. What am I going to do? And the prophet said this, the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. You know, we often underestimate God, and we think that um, uh, you know, God is a million miles away, and we're here just to help ourselves. You know, I got to do this, I got to do that, you know, I got to, you know, and do everything, and, and to kind of get rich and things like that, forgetting that it is the Lord that gave. Uh, when Job um, lost his fortune, his children, even his health, in Job 1.21, he said, um, the Lord gave. And the Lord had taken away. You know, blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, it is the Lord. And um, when we are willing to obey God, the Bible says the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. Um, if you take your Bibles and just put your finger in the Second Chronicles and turn to Psalm 37. I'm sorry, Psalm 81 first and then Psalm 37. Psalm 81 and verse uh, 15 to verse 16. In Psalm 81, and verse 15 and verse 16. In Psalm 81, verse 15, the haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him. But their time should have endured forever. And look at verse 16. He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat. And with honey of the rock should I, have, should I have satisfied thee. You know, when I first read this verse, it kind of uh, taken me aback. I mean, some folks, we say the hater of the Lord. I mean, we hate them. You know, I mean, we have a godly hatred. Uh, sometimes they blaspheme God's name. You know, they do all kinds of things. Um, but uh, even with these people, you know what God say? There is still mercy. There is still love. There is still forgiveness. And God says, even if someone so far away, a million miles away, who hates God, if he were to repent humbly and come back to God, God say, his time will have endured. And God say, I will have fed him with the finest of the wheat, and the honey out of the rock should I have satisfied thee. I say, wow. 
You know what I mean? It's diametrically opposite. At one moment, he's cursed of God, and the next moment, God bless him with the finest of the wind. And, and we see that um, this is how much God is able to give. And so the prophet, uh, back to Second Chronicles 25 and in verse 9, the prophet said, The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. Uh, God knows the desires of the heart. If we delight ourselves in Him, He'll give us the desire of our heart. Um, we think this is what we want and uh, God can give us more. I remember a little story, fictitious story, about a lady with uh, some of her uh, uh, trinkets and jewelry in her hand. And then a voice said, give them up to me. You know what I mean? Or, and then uh, she gave up. And then God gave her a lot more. And then there came a little saying like, uh, the reason God couldn't give me so much is because I hang on to so little. <laughs> you know what I mean? All these little things, trinkets, and God could give me the real thing. And we need to empty our hands. And so, um, you know, the uh, statement given to King Amaziah is the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. Now remember, when we go back to verse 2, Amaziah did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Now, this is the second box he's going to take. And in verse 10, Amaziah separated them to with the army that was come to him out of Ephraim to go home again. Wherefore, their anger was greatly kindled against Judah, and they returned home in great anger. And Amaziah strengthened himself and left off his people and went to the valley of Sod and smote the children of Seir 10,000. And the other 10,000 left alive did the children of Judah carry away captive, and brought them unto the top of the rock, and cast them down from the top of the rock, that they were all broken in pieces. Uh, but the soldiers of the army which Amaziah sent back, uh, that they should not go with him to battle, fell upon the cities of Judah from Samaria, even unto Beth Horon, and smoked three thousand of them, and took uh, much spoil. Amaziah, you know, is going to pass his second test, take his second box. And he said, I'm going to trust God. God is able to give me much more than this. So he went to battle with his own army and he fought the Edomites. And uh, he won the battle. And uh, in the process, he took 10,000 of the captive, go to the top of the cliff, and then threw them down one by one. Must be quite a horrible sight. Uh, the last time I read about this kind of thing is uh, with regard to a tradition about Alexander the Great. You know, when he was about to uh, uh, fight with a particular city, uh, his army behind him, he just took 20 men to the city gate. And of course, it's all locked up, and the people were looking down at Alexandra, and he said, uh, surrender. They, they kind of laugh at him. And then he looked at these 20 men behind him, and there was a cliff. And he told this man, march single kind of line, and then go over the cliff. Every one of those men will march and walk and jump over the cliff. You know, and those inhabitants of the city, they look at horror and they immediately surrender. <laughs> they know if such a man who would just command his, I mean, um, such a uh, king would command his men to just go over the cliff and they go over, they can't imagine when his whole army would come and attack the city. <laughs> and uh, immediately they say, we call it quit, we surrender. But Amaziah, he uh, threw 10,000 of this um, of his enemies over the rock and uh, kill them. Um, well, uh, so far so good. Uh, he passed two tests. One, he, he killed the, the servants that killed his father but not their children. And he has to trust God that he won't boomerang back to him. And two is that uh, when he was told to uh, forgo the Israelis, uh, Israelite, uh, um, the army, uh, he went on his own. He won the battle. And, um, but uh, 20, in verse 2, uh, but uh, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. Now, this thing is going to surface now. Okay, let's read on. In verse 14, now it came to pass after the Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods of the children of Seir and set them up to be his gods and bowed down himself before them and burned incense unto them. Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah. He said unto him, a prophet, which said unto him, Why hast thou sought after the gods of the people, which could not deliver their own people out of thy hand? Amaziah did a strange thing. 
I mean, uh, those days they have these gods of the lo locality. You know, if this nation were to defeat this nation, this nation's god is greater than the, other, the gods of the other nation. That's the concept in those days. And Mazar did a very uh, strange thing, and he fought, and then he saw this, you know, their statue and their idols, and it must have been magnificent. Uh, I mean, if you go to the, uh, in Southeast Asia, some of these statues of Buddha is like 150 feet, 200 feet, you know, and they decorate, you know, with, sometimes with gold and things like, it must be uh, awesome. And so Amaziah brought the gods back. Uh, just a, a few weeks uh, back in Singapore, and uh, we were kind of, um, once a month, uh, the church, our church, we would go out doing tracting. Uh, we would go to the apartment blocks and put a track in every home. Uh, and then when the door is open or when somebody is there, we try to share the gospel with them. There was one home that was, the door was wide open. And uh, in front of it was a statue as tall as me. <laughs> right facing the doorway. I mean, it's huge. You know, I, I wonder, this is a little apartment and you have such a big statue, there, you know, and they decorate and like, it looks beautiful. I can imagine the um, Messiah must have seen such a, uh, a statue, a, a, a god, uh, the gods of the uh, Edomites. And then he brought back to Israel and he started to worship it and burn incense to it. Now, back to uh, verse 2, but not with a perfect heart. You know, we kind of uh, ignore it. Uh, it's just no big deal, not with a perfect heart. Now, as you go down the road in his life, as you journey with him, sooner or later, that, that thing, not with a, the imperfect heart, the problems of imperfect heart, is going to surface. And uh, now he saw another God. You know, he's, he was attracted to this God. Now, of course, today we don't have statues or idols in our home. By anything, it is said that we put above God. It's a statue. It's an idol. You know, in oh. our hearts. Uh, it can be money. You know, it can be sex. You know, I mean, out of uh, the, the family. You know, it can be adultery. It can be fornication. It can be anything. Uh, anything that we put above God uh, will become an idol in our heart. Now, in verse 16, it came to pass as he uh, talked with him that the king said, I'm sorry, um, uh, in verse 15, um, the prophet said to him, uh, why, why do you do this? In verse 16, it came to pass as he talked with him that the king said unto him, Art thou make of the king's counsel? Forbear, why shouldest thou be smitten? Then the prophet forbear and said, I know that God had determined to destroy thee because thou hast done this and hast not hearkened unto my counsel. Um, especially with the young people. Sometimes dad and mom will, to, will tell them, don't do this. And they will challenge. And I would do it. All right? Um, sometimes they think that, well, I've grown up. I've become independent. But folks, it may not be because you have grown up. It may be because you are now in sin and God is about to destroy you. All right? So we see here, uh, the prophets say, uh, if I had to paraphrase it, you are not listening to me. And I, I understand the reason why. Because I know that God had determined to destroy thee because thou hast done this and hast not hearkened unto my counsel. Now, verse 17, as the events are pan out, we see that Amaziah, king of Judah, took advice and sent to Joash, the, king, uh, the son of Jehu Ahaz, the son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us see one another in the face. Now, when we are in sin, uh, we sometimes make a decision that is going to destroy us. We think that's the best decision. <laughs> You know, I mean, Amazon just destroyed the Ammonites, uh, the Edomites, and now it becomes like, hey, I'm powerful. And then now he looked at the king of Israel to the north and said, come, let us look into eye, into, uh, I mean, to look each other in the eye, meaning let's have a fight. Um, you know something? I don't like to say this, but if you and I are in sin, try not to make a major decision in our life. 
You know, I think the major decision we should make when we are in sin is to repent. You know, I mean, get right with God. You know, don't, don't go anywhere, do anything, and think that, you know, we are going to be successful. Um, in verse 18, Johannes, uh, king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, king of Judah, saying the thistle that was in Lebanon, sent to the seed that was in Lebanon, saying, Give thy daughter to my son to wife. And there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon, and trod down the thistle. Thou sayest, Lo, thou hast smitten the Edomites, and thy heart lifted thee up to boats. Abide now at home, why shouldest thou matter to thy herd? That thou shouldest fall even thou and Judah with thee, but and Messiah were not here, for he came from God. You know what a strange thing it says here, he came from God. That he might deliver them to the hand of their enemies, because they sought after the gods of Edom. So Joash, the king of Israel, went up, and they saw one another in the face, both he and Amaziah, king of Judah, at the Bat Shemus, uh, which belonged to Judah. And Judah was put to the worst before Israel, and they fled every man to his tent. And so, um, isn't it strange that the king of Israel is a wicked king? Um, but uh, Amaziah became worse. So, um, the uh, king in the north looks righteous now. <laughs> Well, the king of the south looks pretty bad. But they are, both are equally bad. You know what I mean? So um, sometimes God has to use the lost people you know, to chastise us. You know what I mean? The lost are really bad. But sometimes God will use them to chastise us. And you know, sometimes we are embarrassed before the lost. Um, and then as you, if you will just bypass the rest, as you go down, you find um, they will lose all their gold and silver and, and things like that. And then in verse 25, And Messiah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, lived after the death of Joash, king of Jehoahaz, king of Israel, 15 years. And then in verse 27, Now after that the time that Amaziah did turn away from following the Lord, they made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish. But they sent to Lachish after him and slew him there. And they brought him uh, upon horses and buried him with his fathers in the city of Judah. You know, 25, uh, it shows uh, the mercy of God. Amaziah lived 15 years longer than the northern king. You know, after the battle and everything. He lived 15 years long, longer. But in those 15 years, I, I would see that God is looking at him and say, Amaziah, are you going to repent? And 15 years came and gone, and there's no mention of his repentance. And in verse 27, his own servant conspired against him, and then he fled to Lachish. But how are you going to run away from God? And you know, But they sent to Lachish after him and slew him there and brought him back. You know, when we are in sin, no point running anywhere. In fact, the only place to run to is back to God and say, God, you know, please forgive me. Please forgive me. Um, we think that when Amaziah was killed by his servant, that was the worst thing. Uh, that wasn't the, really the worst thing. I mean, for us all this morning, 25 verse 2, you know, Amaziah, he did what was right, but not with a perfect heart. We are reminded that the Bible tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, uh, someday we have to meet the holy God, but we are sinners. I'd like to mention a man called James Twill. Uh, he's a, he was a, I mean, he's a Jew, but he's one of the uh, top 50 uh, brilliant mind in the world. Uh, he does synthetic uh, molecules, and uh, he has seven, eight companies. And as a Jew, he said this, they don't talk about sin in the family. You know, one day in college, a born-again Christian talked to him about sin, and he still, under, he still didn't understand sin. And he said, I didn't kill anybody. You know, I'm not sin. And then the, that uh, Christian read to him a passage where Jesus said, if you were to look at a woman, to last after her, you have committed adultery in your heart. And James 12 said, man, at that time was addicted to pornography. 
you know, and say, how did a man 2,000 ago write, you know, a statement that hit right into his heart? And uh, that day he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, you know, he's giving talks and debates. You know, he's a creationist. And, um, but uh, he didn't know that he needs the Savior, Jesus Christ. If we are in sin, we need the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Because the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die after this judgment. Uh, my last sermon before I came here was Hell, the place of no return. You know, and I preached a whole sermon on hell. And how the person uh, that spoke the most about hell is the Lord Jesus Christ. The same man that say, uh, blessed are the poor, you know, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the merciful. You know, the same man that is so full of love is the same man that thought the most about hell. You read the gospel. Jesus mentioned more about hell than anybody because hell is real. So I hope that if we do not have the Savior Jesus Christ who came some 2,000 years ago to die on the cross to take our place and pay our sins and he died, buried, and rose again. The Bible says, whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In conclusion, let's look at 2 Chronicles 25 and verse 2 again. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Okay, but the, um, the verse ends with, but not with a perfect heart. All right. Don't take any consolation that my heart is not perfect. It's an accident waiting to happen. It's a sin waiting to be committed. And Amaziah did a couple of right things. But then we see his downfall and towards his end. It was not to his glory. And um, I'm sure Mazar wished that uh, in the beginning of his uh, kingship that he said, I did with a perfect heart. And so um, let us love God, fear God, and uh, desire a perfect heart. With that, uh, let's pray. Father, I want to give thanks for your word and look to you, Lord, that you search our hearts. And if there be one here that may not know thee as personal Lord and Savior, we look to you, Lord, that this morning, that one individual will pray in his or her heart to say, God, please forgive me. I'm a sinner. And I give thanks that Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, came to die for my sin. And now I accept him to be my Savior. And Lord, we know if we have done that, you promise in your word that you'll wash us clean, even through the blood of Christ, to save our soul from hell. Look to you, Lord, that um, some would uh, make that decision even this morning. We want to commit all this even unto your hands. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right.